my talk today is called What is the problem with the, the opacity of artificial intelligence in medicine? Um, so what is the context here? So there is a booming philosophical interest on artificial intelligence and there is a booming, booming literature on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And many fields, uh, disciplines and practice are impacted by artificial intelligence, but medicine is one of these fields. Although I must say that the use of algorithm, especially, especially in medicine, is not that, that recent. Uh, so my background, background uh, is philosophy of medicine. So why did I get interested uh, on, in this topic? So the philosophy of artificial intelligence. And more specifically, why, did I, why am I interested on the concept of opacity? Uh, so the first reason is that um, a few years ago, I did a project on the history of collecting in medicine. So I'm interested in the practices that are involved in collecting data in medicine. Uh, but um, for the for more importantly, for the talk today, um, there is uh, one common feature, which is very interesting to me, between IA, AI sorry, and medicine, uh, and it is opacity. So both uh, AI and medicine, or more specifically contemporary Western medicine, have been referred to as being black boxes or as being opaque. Uh, and so I think there must be some interesting parallels between issues in medicine and issues in artificial intelligence and philosophy of medicine being somewhat older as a field might bring some light, uh, but the reverse is also true. Maybe I will learn as a philosopher of, of medicine uh, from the whole debates uh, in the philosophy of artificial intelligence right now. Um, and so the goal of this talk is going to understand what uh, this opacity is and what it means and whether it is, it is a problem and if so, why? So this is the questions I want to ask today. So first, what does opacity mean? And uh, we'll see that it's not that obvious. Um, then, uh, especially because it's not obvious even if it's an epistemological concept or an ethical or political one. So this is going, uh, this is going to be something uh, I want to understand. Um, then I want to understand what are the arguments against opacity in artificial intelligence in medicine. And I want to see whether they are convincing arguments. And finally, uh, Although this is a work in progress, so today I'm not going to uh, focus a lot on this. Uh, I want to see whether this opacity problem is responsible for uh, the lack of fairness and bias that we see in medical artificial intelligence, but more broadly, even in just uh, medicine or just artificial intelligence. So opacity, um, so let's start with the first meaning of the word opacity and how it is used in the literature. And I think this is the main way it is used by uh, everyone talking about artificial intelligence and the ethics of AI. So the first meaning of the word is that opacity means that, I mean, if something is opaque, it means that we can't explain why we get such and such results and how. So it means opacity hinders our capacity to give explanations. So it's a, explana explana sorry, it's a explainability problem. Um, and opacity in this sense, so the idea that it's a lack of explainability is um, often, and I want to say like almost all the time seen as a problem that, that needs to be fixed. And the opposite concept that people use in that uh, context is transparency. And here, transparency just means that something is not opaque. So it's explainable. Um, and I want to, to make this clear because obviously these concepts are very broad and, and vague, but in this context, in the context of this discussion right now, they just mean that. And Kathleen Creel has um, just published a paper on the concept of opacity and transparency. And she um, defined 
transparency just uh, uh, as the opposite of opacity. And she uh, she quotes some physicists who have uh, who have um, described this situation. So the fact that in artificial intelligence, very very often we can't explain why we get a, uh, a result based on some data we put in the system. Uh, some physicists, uh, she quotes them, regard this situation as a complete nightmare. So opacity has not a good reputation. Um, and, um, and the opposite uh, concept, transparency, uh, has become a virtue for the field of computer science. So you have huge... Um, you have a huge detailed literature on how to make our AI more transparent. And for instance, in our review of 84 ethical guidelines on artificial intelligence, uh, Jobin, Jobin, I'm not sure how to pronounce, um, Yenka and Vajena, uh, in a very, very recent review of the literature, have um, noted that transparency is the most prevalent ethical principle in the current literature. Um, and it was featuring 73 of the sources that they have looked at. So basically, the debate is not even open for discussion. Opacity is bad, transparency is good, and we need to explain artificial intelligence right now. Uh, at least, uh, and I want to see whether this is well argued or not. And I just want to mention that in this uh, review of the eth ethical guidelines, um, there is several of them that are French. And for instance, uh, the guideline that you see on the on the end of the screen uh, mentions that the French president. Uh, has promised that uh, transparency is going to be at the center of artificial intelligence research. And although I want to note, and I will go back to this at the very end of this talk, that uh, if you look at any of these guidelines, uh, it's not clear that any ethical or philosopher was, were involved in the writing of these guidelines. So transparency is the value in the field, but not, it's not necessarily something that philosophers have uh, uh, contributed to uh, make. Uh, I mean, yeah. Although, uh, as we will see, uh, Kathleen Creel especially uh, argued that it is very important. So the first definition is that Opacity is just a lack of expl expl explainability in, in a, when we use a system. And I leave this slide blank because I want to make clear that there are other meanings of opacity. And I will go back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, so the argument against uh, what we will call comp computational opacity, so the fact that at the comp computational level, we don't understand everything. Uh, so there's two arguments uh, mentioned by, well, two claims mentioned uh, by Krill. Um, first, it forbids scientists to produce robust explanations and to detect artifacts. So obviously, um, she argues that this is, this is a huge problem because, um, well, expl expl uh, explaining is like one of the main goal, goal of science. And she also argues, um, among other, uh, that this, is, this situation, the fact that there is a lack of explanatory power in uh, com computer science, uh, is going to foster mistrust from the public about what uh, scientific, scientific expertise even is. And she writes that scientists, modelers, and the public all require transparency and by by this, I mean, she means just explainability, because it facilitates scientific explanation and artifact, artifact detection. As philosophers, we should not recommend abandoning the search for transparency. And I want to quote uh, some other um, passages from her last paper. Um, 
one reason for philosophers to pursue anal an analysis of transparency is that research scientists, computer scientists, and the public all value transparency and could benefit from a better analysis of the concept. And not only do interested parties want transparency, they are right to want it. Uh, transparency in, is necessary to eliminate the, the relationship between the explanants and the explanandum on some leading accounts of scientific explanation. Mechanistic explanation, for example, require, re, re, require transparent access to the relationships between, between consistent parts. So again, she argues that um, we need transparency, we need explainability because, well, we need to be able to explain in science. Um, and the same argument has been made about artificial intelligence in medicine. So a medical decision or a piece of evidence that we can't explain in medicine is, seen, is very often seen as a bad decision in the literature. So whether we can explain it at the uh, at a mechanistic level or a th at a theoretical level. So many people have written that obesity is going to forbid physicians to explain to their patients why they are offering such and such recommendation or why they came to, to know such and such uh, diagnosis. And the second idea is that because of this lack of explanation, people are, are going to uh, start distrusting uh, medical physician even more uh, than they are maybe already. So you see it's very similar. So that there, is, there are two claims, I believe. Uh, the first claim is that science goal is to explain, or at least that the main, one of the main goal of science is to explain. A uh, second idea is that trust in science comes from this uh, explanatory power, uh, or maybe another claim, neighboring claim would be that the lack of this explanatory power is going to lead to mistrust in science. And all of this, these two claims um, are the basis for arguing that opacity in science should be avoided and that transparency, so just expl expl explainability should be activities sought for in science. And so here I just, uh, I, just I was reading another paper yesterday, but I, I, I came across this quote and I think um, you will understand why. Uh, it's Ernst Meyer, a, a biologist uh, who was writing that he had some five or six volumes on my bookshelf, which includes the misleading words, philosophy of science in, in their title. In actual fact, each of these volumes is a philosophy of physics. So I'm not saying that Kathleen Creel is doing that, but um, if we change the previous slide and we change uh, science for medicine, um, we are going to run into some problems. Um, so the first thing would be that medicine's goal is or one of the main goal is to explain in that the public or people or everyone trust medicine based on this explanatory power or the or maybe the opposite or the neighboring claim which would which would be that the lack of explanatory power would lead to mistrust in medicine so and both both of the of these claims would lead to the conclusion that opacity in medicine should be avoided and transparency, explainability should be actively sought for in medicine. And you may be thinking, yes, of course, but I want to show you that, no, 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 actually, I'm very skeptical of these two claims and especially the first one, but because, uh, and I will talk just of, uh, I will talk mainly of this claim uh, in this talk, but I think the second one also doesn't hold that, that well. So why is, I mean, is explanation important at all for medicine? This is actually a, a valid question in philosophy of medicine. So, and the first question we would have to ask is what is a medical uh, explanation? And this is actually very complicated. And I don't believe there is a consensus view of explanation in medicine. So you have many different philosophical accounts of 
what are explanations. So I'm not even going to uh, go into that, but you have the deductive nomological approach, the deductive statist statistical, inductive statistical, statistic whoop, statistical relevance model. Uh, if you are interested into that, I would, I would recommend uh, Le Moine's paper uh, from 2018 on the topic. So you, he reviews all the different um, approach of explanation and try to see whether it, they work for medicine or not. Um, but overall, nowadays, um, the, the main approach to medical explanation would be mechanistic. So it's a simple, simple idea that in physiology, especially, especially uh, the goal is to explain um, causal, causal relationships into a, in a system and then explain this mechanistic, well, no, well, we, we, we find and we discover this me mechanistic mechanism and that's what explaining is. And just for, um, for people watching, not uh, maybe not being familiar with, with what mechanisms are, a uh, mechanism is just an entity which interaction account for the gen general outcomes, the behavior of the system. Uh, but even mechanistic explanation in medicine, or like, like I said, more properly in physiology are of two kinds. So, so there is no agreement on which of these two kinds uh, are more important. For instance, you have the functional explanations that are going to focus on functions, ph physiological functions. So how especially... Um, what are the functional effects of uh, physiological function? But you also are going to be interested in evolutionary explanation. So explaining why effects, uh, why an effect in my body uh, exists rather than something else. And this is also a causal story, but a different one. So there is a huge debate in the philosophy of biology and medicine about this. Um, and I don't believe there is a consensus view of explanation in medicine. I mean, on, on the view, like actually what it means. Um, but the main point I want to, to bring today to the table is that uh, explanation is not going to, whatever it is in medicine, because we are not so sure, but it's not going to be the main goal of uh, Western contemporary uh, medicine. And today, and probably for very long years, medicine will not be able to escape opacity. So recall at the beginning of the talk, I said, yeah, artificial, in artificial intelligence is not the only uh, technology that has been dubbed as a black box. Medicine is also one of them. So today, the the main framework to understand what is scientific medicine is evidence-based medicine. And this approach does not focus on, on mechanistic explanation, whatever it means. Um, it's a simple idea that having evidence that a, tr a treatment works is enough. And we, don't, we do not need, in fact, to explain how or why that tr treatment works. Or at least we, can't, we just can't. Um, so, of course, there are debates in the philosophy of medicine, and some argue that um, having evidence that a treatment, a treatment works necessitate also to make causal claims and therefore mechanistic explanation. This is the Rousseau-Williamson thesis, but uh, it's not necessarily like, I mean, it's a debate, and I wouldn't say that it's the consensus in the field. Uh, definitely, definitely not in the medical field. This is very particular, I believe, to the philosophical uh, debate. Um, and some have argued, interestingly, that uh, mechanisms aren't sufficient to account for medical explanations in the case of epidemiology. So it might be relevant, you know, uh, nowadays, but black box approaches to causation have been defended. Uh, and this is the idea that we can make causal claims without identifying mechanism. And I ref um, if you are interested, the, um, there is a paper by Alexan Alexander Broadbent in 2013 making this claim. So the, I would say that the current view of medicine is um, 
what Kathleen Creel at the beginning of her paper has brushed uh, away, which is the view that it's mostly instrumental. Uh, we are here to see um, what is effective or not. And the goal is not going to be to understand, but to intervene effectively. So it's more akin to a technology or applied science. And so the, the worry is, you know, the idea that it's a nightmare that we don't understand that these physicists had, like in the beginning of the talk, it's not going to be the same uh, at all in the field of medicine. Um, and I'm quoting uh, um, Alex uh, John London, who has made a very similar, I mean, basically the same um, argument in a paper in 2019. He writes that although medicine is one of the oldest productive sciences, its knowledge of underlying causal system is in its infancy. The pathophysiology of disease is often uncertain, and the mechanism through which interventions work is is either not known or not well understood. As a result, decisions that are atheoric, associationist, and opaque are commonplace in medicine. And yeah, and I just wanted to quote this. So the, the main goal of medicine is not going to be uh, explanation, it's, the goal is going to be pragmatic and therapeutic. Uh, and Le Moine in, in his paper, for instance, uh, says that probably most will agree that uh, explanation is going to be subordinate uh, to the therapeutic action. There is at least another understanding of explanation that could be interesting um, regarding medicine, and it's the coherentist account of explanation, uh, which has been argued uh, both by Le Moine and Tagar about medical knowledge. So this is the idea that explanation in medicine is going to give a unified and coherent account of what we know about medicine. So I just wanted to put it out there. Um, I'm not sure yet if this is um, crucial to my talk, uh, although um, because we still don't necessarily need to have a current view of our medical knowledge, you know, to make um, some empirical uh, claims. And so there's therefore the question, uh, the second point, if you remember like the small argument I reconstructed. So can society, the public trust uh, technology? I'm not sure why I brought in Latin, I don't know what I did there. Uh, can society trust a technology if it remains opaque? And Le London he, in his paper goes uh, through engineering and he says, yeah, in the case of engineering, it makes sense. Um, trust in expert in, in the ex, in ex, oh, sorry, the trust in the expert is often grounded on their cap capacity to explain, you know, to give us the, the law of gravity or whatnot. And uh, and so uh, so it seems perf perfectly rational that you know engineer engineer uh, building bridges should explain like why it works like why the bridge is not going to collapse, and he writes that this explanation does help to foster foster social trust by expanding the ability of other stakeholders to understand what what is at stake in various decisions. This foster accountability. This since understanding why a decision was made enables stakeholders to evaluate its merit and hold experts accountable for avoidable error. And when I was making this slide, I suddenly remember a joke that my dad always tell me. And so my dad is an engineer and I believe this uh, joke is very famous in the engineering community uh, in France. And I'm just going to tell you uh, the joke very quickly. Um, it's about three engineers from three, you know, very uh, famous uh, elitist schools, let's say. And the the joke is, what? How do you um, how do you know which one is which? And the joke is that the first guy from the first uh, school, he is building a bridge. The bridge collapses, and he doesn't know why. Uh, the second person from the other school uh, builds a bridge too, and the bridge, you know, 
doesn't uh, does collapse, and this time the second engineer knows why it collapsed. And the last one, and my father always says that he's from this school, he builds the bridge and the bridge um, doesn't collapse, but he doesn't, he doesn't know why, <laughs> he can't explain why. And I was, I was telling him uh, just before this talk, I'm going to you know, tell people this joke. And he said, yes, you should trust the third engineer <laughs> because he's the only one with a bridge that has not collapsed. So I would say even in engineering, maybe it's not very clear uh, that it's perfectly rational to trust only on the basis of explanation. Uh, and I believe bridges have collapsed in the past, even though we had very good explanation for why they shouldn't collapse. So open, open, but it's very interesting to me that my dad brought the trust issue immediately and said, yeah, you should trust my school. Well, forget the French context, but it was like, it, he doesn't, he doesn't, he didn't care that he didn't understand why the bridge uh, wouldn't collapse. In any case, I thought this was very funny. And I think this is what happens with medicine. Basically, you need to trust the third person. <laughs> so can we trust medicine if medicine does not explain? Like, is it possible? So it's both a theoretical question, I believe in an empirical question. Like, we need to check what like whether people are going to trust based on what they understand and what uh, the scientists tell them. Um, and there's a large literature, literature in the philosophy of medicine and history of medicine on vaccines exigency, but also on why people are going to take, you know, alternative medicine. And, and for instance, I wanted to quote uh, Maya Goldenberg um, first, uh, I think, is it just published or it's forthcoming in the spring, but she has a book on public trust, expertise, and the war on science. And she tries to show that the idea that people don't trust vaccines because they don't understand is, mis is misleading and probably also harmful because that's not the reason why they don't trust. There are other reasons and she focused on that. And these reasons are actually um, related to bias and, and, you know, in medicine. And that's what I'm going to, to mention afterwards. But um, yeah, and I mean, I'm not going to uh, spend too much on that because like I said, there is a huge, uh, li huge literature on that. And it's not just philosophy, it's sociology, it's, uh, you know, uh, social science that have to look at that. Um, yes, I wanted, again, the same idea um, uh, in, uh, and uh, a claim also that London made uh, in his paper is that insisting on, you know, we need to explain uh, in the case of, in, oh, well, sorry, in the case of medicine, I, it's going to backfire, basically. There is some caveats. So there is a huge history. I mean, if you look at the history of medicine, you're going to be I mean, uh, you're going to have a huge list of treatments that we had perfectly rational explanation for, um, but who didn't work and were harmful in the end. And you also have a long history of theories in medicine that, ha that have led research completely astray. Um, and so, and yeah, and I for instance think of the fact that not until the end of the 19th century, we didn't have a theory for germ, like the, we didn't have the germ uh, theory of diseases. So we didn't have any mechanistic explanation. We didn't, have, we didn't know why people were sick. Like we, we had no theory or mechanistic explanation. And yet at the time it would have been possible to make empirical data uh, based, you know, some, on some kind of clinical trial that showed that we needed to clean our hands. And this is the famous example of Ineas Semmelweis. Although I need, I need to point out, point out that apparently his reasons weren't so good. Like his, his empirical data maybe wasn't so good, but I just want to, you know, to distinguish this two way of reasoning or in medicine. Um, 
There is a second uh, way medicine is opaque uh, in a very similar way uh, than uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's just the fact that even today, even you know, with evidence-based medicine and such and such, uh, decisions in the medical context are you know, made by physicians whose brain remain completely opaque. So we don't understand what's going on in the brain, but also I, uh, there is another way I believe uh, their decision remains opaque is that we don't know their belief or their cognitive style or even their ethical uh, belief and styles. Um, and in the future, I have this empirical project where I would like to look, to look into that. Um, and in any case, London argues that this blanket requirement that machine learning system in medicine should be explainable or interpretable is uh, unfunded, but also potentially harmful. And this is just the idea that in medicine, you know, we have tr we've tried before um, um, fixing people uh, with just ideas and explanation and it didn't work. So there's an, uh, an interesting case that London mentioned his, uh, at the end of the, his paper, and it's a very uh, famous case in the artificial intelligence in medicine literature. Uh, it was um, a report by uh, Rick uh, Car Caru Car Caruana and colleagues, sorry. Um, and the worry was that this opacity in the, you know, in the computer system that we are going to use is uh, going to somehow lead to artifact, for example, or bias or something completely weird. So, so they had this neural net and it was accurately diagnosing the probability of death from, from, from pneumonia, right? But the problem is that also, also they said uh, the problem was that they ranked asthmatic pe uh, patients had, as having a lower prob probability than the general population of dying from pneumonia, which is counterintuitive because they, they are actually a, a, like a very high risk because they are asthmatic, right? But the, the thing is, it is seen as counterintuitive because asthma asthmatic patients are often directly admitted to intensive care units when they have pneumonia, and that's the only reason why they have a lower lower risk because they are they are able to access uh, more aggressive care basically, and it is counterintuitive only if we assume that the system was predicting the probability of death independently of medical practice when in fact it was predicting it based on current medical practice because the data it was fed was only data on the medical practice. Uh, so, so I'm not sure yet what I'm making of this example because here the problem was not necessarily opacity but more like interpretability like in the sense that here the system wasn't opaque. We knew that the system was uh, had the data from the medical practice. And in the end, it, it wasn't so hard to understand why the, the, um, the result was counterintuitive. So it wasn't that, not, it wasn't uninterpretable. It was not unexplainable. So maybe it was just a bad example, a bad, bad case. Um, and yeah, let me think. Um, So what it shows uh, though is it's that the issues we have with this kind of system is very similar in the end uh, with the issues we have with the results of clinical studies in the sense that we, are, we need to be very careful of what we can conclude from a specific study on a specific uh, population with, with a specific data set. And we can't you know, infer causality where there is none or you know, where we want to move to a larger population or another situation. But I believe these issues are all already there. They're not specific to the use of this system in medicine. 
And then the last point I want to make, um, so um, basically I said that, I said, I argued today that um, obesity as the lack of explainability is not that of a big deal uh, in medicine because, you know, medicine is opaque. So we, we can't, you know, and we, ah, we have good reason to think that uh, it's good to that medicine is opaque like this. Um, but I want to make clear that I think that um, there are other meanings attached to opacity in medicine, especially that are very important, that have a huge impact on medicine and society and medical knowledge. And those meanings could also be very interesting for people in, that want to you know, defend uh, transparency in artificial intelligence in medicine or elsewhere. And these issues uh, in medicine are publication bias, missing data, and the relationship between this issue and the industry funding and regulation. So there are ba ba basically there is opacity everywhere, like down the line where um, medical knowledge is produced. For example, uh, at the moment, where we produce data, where we collect. Um, this is where maybe the opacity is going to be more problematical because we're not going to understand uh, what is the population involved, for instance. But we might have also opacity uh, on who is going to publish, uh, you know, uh, what are the links with the industry, and et cetera, et cetera. And here there is a huge uh, literature in the philosophy of medicine on pharmaceutical companies, but also on the idea that, uh, uh, well, on the idea of ignorance or just the fact that we don't know, which might be more in important in medicine uh, than opacity, the fact that we can't explain. Uh, but anyway, the way science is organ, um, I should should have written medicine, but the way medicine is organized, organized in such a way that some important knowledge goes missing uh, is a problem that could fall under the opacity problem, I believe. And I also believe that, I, and I would be interested to, to argue this in more detail, but that in medicine, at least, these areas, uh, like these other meanings of opacity, if you want, are more likely to be linked uh, or at least they have been linked more clearly in the liter literature to issues of mistrust and also of bias. So, yeah. And the one worry, one last worry that I have is that this, like I said, this talk uh, around transparency is ubiquitous and everybody is looking for trying to explain uh, their artificial intelligence uh, systems. Um, but I worry that maybe it might cast a small screen on the other ways uh, I mentioned, medicine and also artificial intelligence uh, lack transparency, uh, notably at the level of how data, data is produced. And so, you know, if you see, you know, um, a box and, and you, you have this company that, if their um, project is explainable, then they would, you know, they would mark it down as, as transparent. Um, and I think it will be a problem if we reduce the meaning of the word to just explainability. Uh, although I'm not claiming that, for instance, uh, Kathleen Creel in the beginning of the talk, in the paper I mentioned is doing that. She's clearly distinguishing explainability and the lack of explainability uh, to these other um, concepts of opacity. But what I want to argue is that these concepts are the one we want to look at and not, you know, explanation. And so this slide is just a, a list uh, that I could come uh, of uh, opacity concept uh, be beyond explainability and transparency that I could think of, but opacity as the concealment of information on how the data was acquired, but also in the scientific research process and publication process, um, opacity on whether an uh, an, uh, uh, a computer system is actually be being used is it you know, is it transparent or not? And then there's, of course, Patrick will maybe ask question about that, but um, some issues on the legal uh, aspect of 
the responsibility, and this could also be defined as OPAC because OPAC is such a general term. And I also wanted to conclude on opacity on who's doing the ethical research. And like I said, like I mentioned French um, report on the ethics of AI, artificial intelligence that were not done by philosophers or scientists or it's not clear. So, and I also know that, uh, I mean, it's a problem today. Uh, universities are not the only one producing um, and um, producing uh, a literature on the ethics of artificial intelligence and industry, the industry is also doing that. And so yeah, so it's also a question. So uh, I'm going to wrap up. I'm sorry, I forgot to add a bibliography, but if you need a reference, just uh, send me an email. But what is the problem uh, with the opacity of artificial in medicine? Well, if by opacity, we mean the lack of explainability, it's not going to be clear that it's such a huge problem, mainly because, well, medicine's goal main goal is not going to explain at all. Uh, but um, more work needs to be done on the other way. Um, medical artificial intelligence can be opaque. Um, and this is all this meanings, uh, different concept I mentioned. And also uh, more work should be done on specific cases like understanding whether on one case, uh, whether like what kind of opacity played there, um, played a role there. And that's it for today. Thank you for listening.